Hi, welcome back to Green Theory. My name is Sam. Today I'll be taking you through some of the most popular fin fishes you buy and eat every day and tell you a little bit more about which varieties you can look for to reduce the environmental impact of your purchases. I decided to touch on some of the more popular fin fishes that you see in grocery stores and restaurants so that you can apply some of this info in your day-to-day -day life. Sure, the hake may be a great sustainable fish, but it's hardly practical to know about if you can't find it anywhere. You may wonder, now, how do I know any of this stuff is even true? And I'll tell you, I'm no marine biologist, but I have learned how to use Google, and I've compiled a series of reliable sources from which I've pulled these findings. Accordingly, I'm going to plug the main tool which helped me make this research possible. The Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Selector is an excellent tool where you can quickly look up any kind of fish and see a quick review of specific fisheries from all around the world for all different species. You can also check out quick buying tips if you want to learn what to look for in general for your favorite fish. Check out the link in the description and see for yourself. There are also a couple of other seafood selectors I cross-reference with, but they aren't nearly as up-to-date or thorough. Now it's time to talk certs. I'm talking about my two favorite fishery bad boys, the MSC and ASC. These two nonprofit organizations are the law of the land, or C, when it comes down to determining whether a product is ultimately sustainable or not. Strict standards and frequent repealing of certifications keeps fisheries on their toes and keeps a healthy line of retailers eager to get a logo on their packaging. The Aquaculture Stewardship Council, or ASC, deals with captive fish and marine animal management. Basically, if you see this logo on something, it means purchasing the item is supporting a diligent and responsible fishery that isn't harming the existing natural system in any dramatic way. Aquaculture, by the way, is a general term for raising fish and sea animals in a human-controlled environment. I've talked a lot more about the Marine Stewardship Council, the MSC, which does pretty much the same thing but for wild fish in my other video. Because of advancements in engineering and new understanding of biology, aquaculture recently outpaced wild-caught fish in total food output around the year 2012. You can also see lists of suppliers and retailers who sell goods rocking these certs on their websites linked below if you're interested in that. Even McDonald's has managed to get every single filet fish sandwich MSC certified, which is totally badass and demonstrates that there's really no excuse for anyone else. With all that aside, let's see what our finned friends have got in store for us. Tilapia are lean, protein-dense fish which can subsist on almost nothing, making them surprisingly sustainable despite the reputation of being dirty bottom feeders. The net protein yield, that is, the total amount of protein which comes from the fish minus the food input to create it, is incredibly high for such a complex organism. Unfortunately, these humble fish are also famous for their low count of omega-3 fatty acids, which is a very healthy compound for humans to consume and is a huge selling point for eating fish in general. While shopping, look for farmed ASC-approved tilapia from raceways, which are basically shallow tanks with a directional water flow, indoor tanks, and outdoor ponds, most often out of Ecuador and Peru. Watch out for Chinese-produced tilapia. Antibiotic overuse has created a general antibiotic resistance in the area, and escaped individuals have been found to establish wild communities, which disrupt local ecosystems. Also avoid ponds and indoor tanks which don't use wastewater treatment methods or outdoor net pens. Put simply, ones that are missing that ASC label. Another famously eaten bottom feeder, catfish supply millions of people with much needed sustenance every day, especially near the tropics where they do the best. When prepared right, it's a delicious and nutritious fish that can be found in most cuisines, always being used in a new, clever way. Look for blue catfish, caught in any number of ways, like beach sends, fike nets, and set gill nets, and US-grown channel catfish, aquacultured in ponds or indoor recirculating tanks. Also look for sushi catfish, a fish which is shoved in a bucket with similar catfish and given an obscene variety of names, including iridescent shark, again, catfish, not an actual shark. Please, for the love of God, do not eat any shark under any circumstances. They're in horrible danger of extinction from overfishing and millions of them are just slaughtered for their fins every year and thrown back in the water still alive. And they're just such an important keystone group of species for balancing oceanic ecosystems. I mean, in the past 50 years, there's been a drop of like 71% on shark populations and at least 25 shark species are critically endangered or endangered and many of them are on track to soon follow.
You want to avoid Chinese raised channel catfish as once again chemical overuse, disease proliferation, and toxic discharge into surrounding waters has earned them a bad sustainability score for now. These oily little forage fish often hang out in large schools for protection and serve as an intermediary rung between the ocean's smallest organisms and its larger carnivores. You can often find them canned in the store as their small, fragile nature does not lend itself to being shipped around and filleted like other larger fish. People tend to worry about the little bones, which you can find if you look hard enough, but trust me, they're hardly noticeable among the other textures when chewing and they break down really easily. That doesn't mean that they aren't a great opportunity for delicious food if you're clever. As you may have heard, they make a popular savory pizza topping. You may also know them from the famous ancient Roman condiment, garum. I like to use them as a component in a homemade Caesar dressing. You'll want to look for Peruvian, Argentinian, European, and North African caught anchovies via Persson and from midwater trawls, as long as they're coming out of the Atlantic or oceans otherwise. Persons are large nets which are dragged around in a large school of fish, then pulled closed at the top and bottom. Midwater trolls are large, tube-shaped nets dragged through the water at cruising depths of the desired fish. Avoid any Mediterranean-caught anchovies, as there has been poor management and knowledge of wild population numbers and a decent amount of unnecessary bycatch in the area. When a species in the middle of the food chain is compromised like this, it can be even more threatening to the well-being of an ecosystem because they help to regulate and feed so many other species. Mackerel is the poorly defined common name for quite a few similar mid-sized pelagic fish, mostly belonging to the Scombridae family, and they're basically Tuna's younger cousin, with a prolific breadth of species. Mackerel isn't the most popular fish, mostly because of its bad reputation of being fishy and greasy. Fresh mackerel really doesn't live up to these stereotypes though. It's actually quite similar to salmon in both flavor and texture and is one of the healthiest fish that you can eat, being naturally high in omega-3 fatty acids. And it pairs amazingly well with acidic and briny flavors like citrus, tomato, and capers. Look for mackerel from the Northeast Atlantic caught by hook and line or hand lines which is basically any organization of hooks and lines set to catch fish that isn't a rod and reel, and American caught Atka mackerel. In general, your best bet is to find American mackerel or mackerel that's been fished from the Pacific. Most Atlantic fisheries suffer from a harmful bycatch and overfishing. Many other methods of fishing mackerel, like Persen, ring net, pelagic trawl, and gill and fix net, are currently in a very ambiguous, unknown place some even having had their MSC certification suspended over fishery management concerns. Some species have become severely overfished in their areas, so it's important to read up before you buy. That said, mackerel are fished almost everywhere in the world, so check those labels for certifications. You never know what you might find. Tuna's popularity alongside increasing sushi consumption each year certainly can't be denied. And I'll bet pretty much everyone watching this video has tried tuna in one way or another. Raw tuna eaten in sushi has a pleasant, chewy texture, beautiful color, and a lack of fishy taste, which makes it a super popular choice for Americans and around the world, often as the most popular sushi protein. Unfortunately, gross overfishing of certain species, namely those used for sushi-grade tuna fillets, has put some tuna on the chopping block, and if we aren't careful, we might lose them for good. The bluefin tuna is one of the largest, fastest, and most beautiful predators in our oceans, traits which have really come back to bite it in the tail. Some reports show that humans fishing has brought this once epic fishery to a shocking 2.6% of its former glory, leaving only a couple hundred thousand reproducing adults in the wild today. So if you see the word bluefin, which can refer to three different subspecies or no label on your tuna, please consider skipping it. Look for albacore, big eye, skipjack, and yellowfin tuna from US fisheries or any internationally caught tuna by hand lines, trolling lines, or similar methods, as long as they specify the aforementioned species. Conservation efforts have brought the albacore and yellowtail tuna back at a surprising speed, pulling them out of the endangered and threatened classification, which just goes to show how effective remediation efforts can be when executed properly. As I said before, watch out for any tuna with obscure labeling about species or harvest method, and you should be okay when shopping. As predators near the top of the food chain, tuna have also been known to gather mercury toxicity through a process called bioaccumulation. Mercury originally gets into water systems through human pollution. 
either by direct discharge, such as that by mining waste, or precipitation pulling it out of the atmosphere. Bioaccumulation refers to larger organisms which can gather toxic compounds through their food. Since the toxic compound or element can't be dealt with by normal biological functions, it persists in any organism that happens to eat it, which means that any amount found in your food will also hang around in you. This process of passing toxins up a food chain and increasing concentration at each level is called biomagnification. This happens between fish and the humans that eat them as well. It's typically safer for us to eat organisms lower on the food chain simply because they haven't accumulated as much mercury or other toxic compounds. Many scientists recommend only having tuna once in a while and avoiding it altogether if you are health compromised or pregnant to avoid the most risk. Overconsumption of mercury can cause poor brain function, increased chances of anxiety and depression, heart disease, and infant development problems. I grouped these two fish together because they serve similar roles in the food system. Lots of cod from the northern Atlantic and Arctic oceans fished by European countries has been certified as sustainable, as well as American caught Pacific cod, such as that from Alaska. Watch out for American and Canadian caught Atlantic cod. This small population is really struggling from a lack of management and suffers from a lot of overfishing and endangered bycatch. Again, get Atlantic cod from abroad, Pacific from the US. Similarly, Alaskan Pollock is a great sustainable option for US buyers and many countries abroad on the Atlantic host a heavily certified series of fisheries. You may not purchase these light, mild, and flaky fish often, but they sneak onto a surprising number of American plates via fish sticks and fish sandwiches regularly clocking in at the 7th and 5th most consumed fish in the states every year, respectively. These similar freshwater spawning fishes are members of the Salmonidae family, yes, that one, and they are kind of salmon's ugly cousin in both appearance and taste. There are so many char and trout, and they essentially have the same physiology and other characteristics, so I'm just grouping them together here, despite their breadth of origin locations. Look for farmed rainbow and steelhead trout, brook and brown trout worldwide, and either wild or farmed arctic char. Try to avoid Colombian rainbow trout, hopefully there should be plenty of American options for you to choose from. Also, lake trout from the Great Lakes has had spotty performance and inconsistent reporting recently, so maybe look for a certification if you're buying from there. Salmon is another highly popular and nearly over-cultivated fish which is farmed and caught wild all around the world with a huge upswing in its demand and consumption over the past few decades. If you're looking for the sustainable stuff, look for any wild-caught salmon that is MSC certified, land-based or tank-based aquaculture settings, basically anything that is closed off from natural bodies of water if it's being raised on a farm, especially when they are ASC certified, like those from Maine, British Columbia, and New Zealand. However, my official recommendation, the winner of the Good Noodle Star for this video has got to be Alaskan Wild Caught Salmon. Popularly thought to be the healthiest and most flavorful of salmons, their unique natural color comes in deep, rich pink hues, and the beauty is reflected in the flavor. These fisheries are super well managed and sustainable, despite having a huge variety of capture methods. You may be thinking, wait, what do you mean unique natural color? That's right, pink is added to farmed salmons which includes almost all the sushi and salmon fillets you probably ever picked up from your local supermarket. In the wild, the pink color comes from the salmon's natural diet of shrimp and krill and a compound that the crustaceans manufacture called astaxanthin. In the farms, they eat pellets made of corn, soybeans, and chicken with artificial astaxanthin manufactured and mixed in. Watch out for marine or conventional net pen farmed salmons from Europe, Canada, and other countries. Overuse of chemicals, effects of escapees on local ecology, and disease and pest proliferation like sea lice have earned them this bad reputation. Escapees offer undesirable genetic traits, meaning they're good for eating, not for survival, into local gene pools which can affect their fitness of the population in general. Popular culprits of this farming style are Scotland, Norway, and Chile, and these fillets are everywhere, so watch out for those labels. Yellowtail, more often seen to Americans as hamachi in sushi restaurants, are sleek tuna-like fish which usually go by the name Amberjack and one goes by Almaco Jack. As you may have guessed, most of it is provided by Japanese fisheries, but this booming international export is not sustainable. 
They rely on wild sardines as feed, the farm's chemical and antibiotic usage and disease proliferation, as well as nutrient discharge and wild broodstock usage, all contribute to its poor sustainability rating. Also avoid wild-caught amberjacks from Mexico, which use drift and set gill nets, which are famous for their terrible bycatch. Look for U.S. caught wild amberjacks and farmed amberjacks from anywhere in the Americas. You don't know where your local sushi joint gets its hamachi? Maybe it's time to try making it yourself at home. And there we have it. I really hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about your food, and I hope that you could take something away from this video, which will help you make better decisions in the future when choosing seafood. I was first inspired to make this video when I considered becoming pescatarian, and I thought, is seafood really more sustainable than meat across the board? And as it turns out, there's a huge breadth to how good or bad your decision to eat seafood can really be. Check out my other video if you want to learn about shellfish and crustaceans. If you want to help make a difference, tell your friends, look for those labels, and talk about sustainability. This has been Sam, and as always, make good choices.